of uh, of, of Old York Road Temple Beth Am, and uh, we have worked together before on programs at Woodmere. Um, Rabbi Tornberg is a person of faith and spirituality and a leader in that regard, and also someone with a very deep personal connection to art. Hence, um, our um, collaborations at Woodmere. It's an enormous honor tonight to be here with you, Rabbi Tornberg. And um, you know, I invite you also to please introduce yourself to our, to our guests. Thank you, Bill. It's a pleasure to be here, and I, I really appreciate you and Hildy and your team reaching out uh, to extend our collaboration once mm -hmm. again, uh, because uh, it's really exciting to be able to be in conversation about these powerful images with you. I wanted to welcome everyone and to acknowledge that tonight is the 84th anniversary of Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass, the uh, some would say the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning for Jews in Germany in 1938, uh, when there was rioting and looting of Jewish homes and businesses that kind of set off the uh, downward spiral that had been threatening to arise in, uh, in German Jewish life. So it's uh, particularly meaningful that we would look at this period in our history tonight. And I hope that through our exploration of Biddle's words and his artwork, uh, which are you'll see in concert with one another, that we'll be able to wrestle some meaning from his work that perhaps can help us uh, with some of the challenges that we all face in our own day. Well, thank you very much um, for that. Um, with that, I just want, you know, in the spirit of housekeeping, encourage everyone who's here to please, if you have questions, put them <clears throat> in the chat. Um, Hilly Tao, the Curator of Education at Woodmere, is monitoring the chat. Um, we are going to take questions and we're going to take as much time as, as is necessary at the end of the webinar to engage with questions. And so we encourage that. Um, if there's something urgent, say in the chat, here's an urgent question. Um, we will be glad um, to, to, to stop and address things that, um, that, that, that feel pressing. We are recording this webinar and it will be posted on Woodmere's website. Um, I am going to now go into full screen mode so that the, the actual PowerPoint slides can be larger, which will make our images larger. And, um, and, and I will describe just the, um, just the organization of, you know, our presentation tonight. I am going to start um, by introducing George Biddle and the exhibition, George Biddle, Art of the American Social Conscience, to give the background that brought George Biddle, the artist, up to the point where he was commissioned by Look Magazine. Look Magazine was, you know, the, the number one competitor of Life Magazine in the um, middle decades of the 20th century in American popular culture. It was a popular magazine. Um, and, uh, you know, largely photography based, but also art based. They worked with artists on a regular basis to create um, images that um, brought the emotions of American and global life um, to their readers. Um, just on a quick um, little visit to Wikipedia, I learned that, um, that, that Look Magazine at its height um, had 8 million readers a week or 8 million subscribers a week. That's extraordinary. Um, think about, um, you know, that's compared to Life, which had 13.5 million readers a week um, at its height. So um, George Biddle um, is hired by Look Magazine to go to Nuremberg to document um, what he witnessed there at the Nuremberg trials. 
I'm going to describe his background as an artist, what brings him up to Nuremberg. I'm going to walk us through the two published articles that George Biddle created. He wrote the text and he provided the images for two articles that appeared in um, in um, in in, um, uh, uh, in in two specific um, copies of, of Look magazine, one in April and one in June of 1946. I'm then going to um, give um, the speaking role over to Rabbi Tornberg, who will walk us through the specific images, share her thoughts um, about you know how these things are you know relevant to um, our lives today, um, and then. I, I'll have a couple of questions for Rabbi Tornberg, and we will open the questions um, out to all of you, and we encourage participation. So um, thank you for joining us tonight, and we're going to dive in right now with some, some images, um, just so that um, for those of you who may not be um, familiar with Woodmere, and you know, I, I know we have some um, webinar guests from Pittsburgh and from elsewhere, so welcome. Woodmere has one of the very beautiful exhibition spaces in all of Philadelphia, and I'm showing our beautiful um, Catherine Cook Gallery and Dorothy J. Del Bueno Balcony Gallery, um, where um, the exhibition George Biddle takes place. You can see it's an exhibition that brings together paintings as well as drawings and prints, um, even ceramic plates and pieces of furniture that George Biddle um, made throughout his life. This is an exhibition that we started thinking about and working on um, in 2014. I mean, sometimes these exhibitions have a long gestation. And we're going to be talking tonight about a group of works, um, actually a large group of works um, that George Biddle made in Nuremberg. I'm showing you the section of the exhibition dedicated to these Nuremberg drawings. Um, we only have four of them on view, plus a print that I'll be talking about. Um, I'm sure you can see the two rats and the reclining figure. That's an earlier print. But you know, this is the section of the exhibition that presents some of the works that George Biddle made in Nuremberg. And I'm showing this little part of the exhibition to say that um, you know, what's, what's so very um, important here is that we are on the beginning of a journey with this body of work. There are, you know, I, I, um, I would say there are between 75 and 100 of these drawings from Nuremberg and related drawings that George Biddle um, made. And, um, you know, as I said, we, we started organizing the show in 2014. Um, we discovered this portfolio of drawings in the home, in the studio of the artist, working with the artist's family in August of this year. So, you know, this was a late entry into the exhibition checklist. We knew that we were working with very powerful material. We wanted to include it in the show, but we also know that we needed time to come to grips with what these incredibly powerful, moving, and disturbing um, works of art are, what they represent. So um, we're showing a small number of them in the current exhibition. Um, there are many more, and you know we've made a determination that you know these works of art, which have been gifted to Woodmere by the family, need to be um, explored in greater depth in a larger exhibition that is just about them and the story that they tell. Um, we are you know, now at the beginning phases of thinking about that. And this webinar tonight represents our wish to open up this conversation as we prepare to engage with this body of work in a much deeper way in, a, in an exhibition that can be its own, and that can hopefully travel to other places because we believe that this is a body of work that you know truly has 
global significance and speaks of um, a turning point event in 20th century history. Um, George Biddle, self-portrait from 1933. Um, this is a painting that belongs to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And in 2014, I say that the exhibition began um, um, insofar as it began in my mind, standing in front of this painting when it was on view at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And um, I, I knew of George Biddle um, as an artist. I didn't know terribly much about him. And I would say that this was the first painting that really captivated me by George Biddle. Here was a man um, I did the quick math at my head from the label on um, next to the painting. It was made in 1933, but George Biddle was born in 1885. Um, you know, that makes him 48 years old here. So here's a self portrait of a man who has seen much of the world. He depicts himself in a trench coat. He's looking out, addressing the viewer directly. He sets himself up against a forest of birch trees, and he seems purposeful. He, it's an artist presenting himself as an outdoorsman, somebody who's on a journey, um, and it's a journey of serious intent. That was clear to me from this first um, picture that really captured my interest about George Biddle. Um, and the more that I learned about him, the more interesting I found out that his journey um, through life and as an artist was. He was born to the distinguished Biddle family of Philadelphia, a family that goes back to um, the times of the American Revolution and perhaps um, earlier than that, um, the distinguished family whose historic home Andalusia, um, you see on the screen that it's a Victorian house with a Parthenon temple front facing the Delaware River, one of the great historic houses of America, spectacular gardens at Andalusia, the seat of um, the Biddle family. George Biddle is born to extraordinary heights of privilege, sophistication, education. In his diary, he describes a childhood where you know, politicians, artists, great writers, great educators of the city of Philadelphia are passing through his family home. He doesn't grow up in Andalusia, but um, he's describing um, his childhood. Um, he's conscious of, you know, the privilege of his life. And, um, you know, and, and that does come into play somewhat in our presentation tonight. And I would say, it's important to remember because George Biddle, um, I mean, this is a man of extraordinary self-awareness, but there are, you know, areas in the way he writes and the way he describes the world that do reflect um, the high level of, you know, education and privilege, you know, that became his worldview. I mean, this was a world where there was a hierarchy. To be from a distinguished family, um, you know, meant something. To be a person of high levels of education meant um, something. And you know, you will find, for example, that you know he kind of looks down on in his writing to you know people who come from small towns and are unsophisticated. And um, you know, this is just part of the world of George Biddle, for better and for worse. It's part of his story. Um, he went to boarding school. Um, he went to boarding school together with his brother Francis Biddle, who was a year younger than he was. Um, Francis will play a role in the story that we hear today. Um, he went to Groton, he went to Harvard um, together with his brother, um, also together with a man who would become famous in 20th century American life. That's Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, with whom he and his brother would both be closely associated with. They all went from Groton to Harvard, from Harvard to Harvard Law School. George, uh, you know, did okay in law school, although it was his brother Francis who would be the real star at Harvard Law School. Um, Francis wrote about that. He determined after law school, um, he would 
um, apply himself, and he did, in fact, pass the Pennsylvania bar. And then he picked up and realized, you know, law is not for me. Art is my calling. And lucky for him, um, a family friend was the great Mary Cassatt, um, one of the leading American artists of all time, let's say, an artist who helped shape the art movement that we call Impressionism. And, um, you know, Mary Cassatt takes George Biddle under her wing in Paris. She introduces him to the avant-garde. I'm showing on the screen uh, an early work from um, 1917 by George Biddle. He made it in Paris. And if you know anything about Mary Cassatt's art and can conjure some of her images of mothers and children, um, you can see that George Biddle is, you know, very much inspired and is learning his way through um, um, the process of becoming an artist under the wing of Mary Cassatt, who, you know, introduces her, him to her friends. And that's, of course, Edgar Degas and Monet and Renoir. And um, again, George Biddle writes about this quite a bit, you know, how the world of art was opened to him by Mary Cassatt. Um, in 1917, George Biddle, enrolls in the United States Army. It is the time of World War I, and you can see there his photograph as captain. He was a captain in the United States Army. Um, it didn't occur to me until preparing this presentation tonight that the trench coat that he's wearing in 1933 is a lot like that trench coat that he wore um, in his World War I soldier's uniform. And of course, trench coats come from the trenches from World War I. George Biddle was a captain. He was fluent in French and um, spoke German extremely well. He had studied art in Germany as well as in France. And so he was given the job in the trenches, a job that he described as quite brutal. Um, he was given the job of interrogating German prisoners when they were captured, relaying the information that could be a, a, a extracted um, sometimes in a man's dying breath, um, conveying that information back to French headquarters so it could be used um, by the French to gain advantage in the war. Um, that was um, an extraordinary experience that I believe, you know, really sticks with George Biddle through life. And, you know, it hadn't occurred to me again until tonight that there really is a resonance between this photograph, which again comes from the artist's own, um, you know, files and photographs um, that he had saved um, in life. Um, George Biddle in, in 1929 married another artist, the artist Hélène Sardot. Here is George Biddle's portrait of Hélène. Um, she's pregnant in this painting and you might get a sense that she is um, voluptuous of body, and um, she's coming to motherhood in this photograph. She's holding on, but her body is doing what it has to do. And I think, you know, we feel that in this amazing um, portrait of her. I want to describe that Helen's journey intertw becomes intertwined with that of George. They're collaborators on major art projects, murals that they do, and in Brazil, in Mexico. Um, Helen's life journey is one of significance to this story. Her family, her parents uh, were from a, a family of Krakow, Germany. They were a Jewish family from Krakow, Krakow that left Poland in the mid 1880s, escaping the Russian pogroms. Um, the, 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 the Russian Tsar was blaming all Jews for um, the assassination of a Tsar and as a punishment of the, the pogroms were, were implemented and Helen's family was a family that fled. They went from her parents um, and older siblings fled from Krakow first to Australia, from Australia to Belgium. It was in Belgium that Helen was born. She was the youngest, uh, I believe, of five siblings. Um, and, and 
finally, um, um, after almost 20 years after leaving Poland, um, Helen's family, um, and by the way, this is the Silberfeld family. Helen was born Helen Silberfeld. Um, in 1934, the family um, with very young Helen moved, uh, 1913, the family moved from Belgium to New York. Um, the next thing we know about Helen is that she's attending Barnard College. Um, she then studies art in Paris, um, moves back to New York, and it's um, in the late 1920s in New York that she meets um, George Biddle. Uh, Helen is a sculptor and um, in Philadelphia, if you are, um, if you jog or if you ride your bike or you just enjoy walking along Kelly Drive, her sculpture, The Slave, is you know, really quite something. I, I don't want to get that deep into The Slave, but it's one of the most interesting, in my opinion, parts of the um, Ellen Phillips Samuel Memorial that is um, stewarded by the Association for Public Art. We just had a great um, program over the weekend at Kelly Drive talking about Helen and, and her art, The Slave. But um, there's no question in my mind that Helen, um, given her family background, identifies with um, Black Americans and the discrimination that they feel. And I do believe, you know, and as we, you know, we're, we're going to go back to George Biddle and his journey and the Nuremberg drawings by George, but there's no question in my mind as well um, that for George, you know, with Helen and his wife, um, the, the, the horrors of the Holocaust and um, the, 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 you know, the violent anti-Semitism is something uh, uh, of Nazi Germany is something that for George, um, hits close to home um, and is personal. Um, if, if you know anything about George Biddle, he's famous for having suggested to his friend, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, that there's this great mural arts movement happening in Mexico, in Mexico City. He's friendly with Diego Rivera. He's friends with Diego Rivera. They go on sketching trips together in Mexico. And he comes back and he writes to his friend, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, there's this great art movement in Mexico and the federal government of the United States needs to do the same. And so, um, you know, the mural movement is taking shape, you know, all around, but, you know, George Biddle has an amazing social network and um, he does get the attention of the president of the United States. And um, from this point on, George Biddle, who, as I said, has been to law school um, you know, he knows how to organize people, he's a good administrator, and his punishment for suggesting a good idea is that he um, is invited to join federal committees. Sometimes he's chairing committees on a federal level that are all about getting art, um, you know, out of the gallery, out of the museum, and into the public realm. And, you know, that could be a mural in a great public building, or it could be um, artists working, you know, with the newspapers of America and magazines, getting art out to people where people are. I'm showing on the right a work by George Biddle from 1930 to say this is a very socially minded, social justice focused artist. Sacco and Van, in memoriam, Sacco and Vanzetti is a print by him that became. Um, became noted and admired in the world of the arts. Um, in the 19, in, in 1930, Sacco and Vanzetti were two Italian immigrants who were accused, um, I believe in the early 1920s. Um, they went to trial and were convicted of murder in a robbery situation. Um, it was broadly believed that the charges were trumped up or at least that the evidence was very weak. And all through the 1920s is a you know, movement um, for, for social justice for you know, the two Italian immigrants, Sacco and Vanzetti, who are eventually executed in the electric chair and killed. And um, it's an example of, of, of 
of racial prejudice, of bias, of anti-immigration sentiment that, um, you know, again, you know, should, should feel resonant to what, um, you know, some of the forces at work in American life today. But, you know, George Biddle, together with his friend Ben Sean, who also has a famous image of, of, um, of Sacco and Vanzetti, he shows, um, you know, a Mater Dolorosa, a figure of, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the great earth mother mourning their deaths. And there they are in a lower register, a kind of grave where their shrouded bodies are um, preserved. Um, George Biddle's um, dedication to an art that expresses the emotions of, of the political life of, of the country and the world is expressed in an amazing print from 1937 titled Mussolini Hitler, Let Her Bleed a Little More. Um, this is 1937. Um, Mussolini, and, Mussolini and Hitler are personified in these two rats. This is a political cartoon become a work of fine art. There are two knives, one from Mussolini, one from Hitler, driven into the heart of the nation of Spain, because of course, Mussolini and, and Hitler aided, sent, um, sent troops um, and supported the fascist dictator Franco in his overthrow of the parliamentary government of the nation of Spain. So that's Spain dying and the two rats, Hitler and Mussolini are saying, let her bleed a little more. Um, George Biddle could work in this way. I mean, this is the language of political cartooning. Um, he is, you know, the, he, he, he's turning these two political figures into rats. This is the sort of thing, like maybe you would see this in the New Yorker. Um, uh, New Yorker magazine, but you know, I, I do want to make the point, and this again will be relevant to the Nuremberg um, work. Um, you know, whereas the Sacco and Vanzetti image is ardent um, in every way, um, the 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 Let Her Bleed image is equally ardent. I mean, it's a disturbing political image, but he's using a different kind of strategy as an artist, as a cartoonist, as a satirist to get his point across and to get people's attention. Um, in 1943, George Biddle was appointed chairman of the US War Department's Art Advisory Committee. And in this, his job was to recruit and assign artists to working with different publications, magazines like Life Magazine, like Look Magazine, Reader's Digest, Coronet, there's a long list of publications that had artists assigned to them and the federal government gave, uh, provided the funding such that the artists could accompany US troops on the battlefield. This was in the Pacific, this was in Europe, this was in North Africa, um, where the Second World War was being fought artists were being sent in. And um, I, I have a copy here of the language that George Biddle, as the chair of the committee that organized this effort, this is what, this is the instruction that he gave to the artists who um, participated in this global project. Any subject is in order if, as artists, you feel that it is part of war. So this is about what artists are feeling. He's encouraging character, caricature sketches, and he's sort of setting this in contrast to official portraits. Like we don't want official portraits of people. We want character sketches. We want the art to put across something that goes deeper than, you know, perhaps, you know, what can be obtained in an official portrait or maybe in a photograph. So we want character sketches, omit nothing duplicate, you know, follow your heart, you know, duplicate to your heart's intent, express if you can, 
realistically or symbolically. You know, like use whatever language you have to get to the essence and the spirit of the war. And he concludes by saying, this is a service of great value to um, our country. So George Biddle chairs this committee. He sends um, 79 artists off to war and then assigns himself to work for Life magazine. Um, and he assigns himself to accompany a regiment, a division of the US Army that is in Tunisia, in North Africa, and is scheduled um, to go to Italy, part of the, um, part of the um, effort on the part of the United States Army to march up the boot of Italy and free, um, free um, Italy. Rome was under um, German Nazi occupation. And you see here, report from the Italian front. This is in George Biddle's own words. And here's a drawing of a beautiful Italian hill town that had become a theater of war. And um, he's describing that in the article that appeared in Life magazine. Um, and um, we have at Woodmere some of the very amazing, beautifully delicate, but heartbreaking drawings that he made in Italy. Some of them appeared in Life, like the drawing you see on the right, Child Killed by Bombing of 1943. That actually made it into the publication. Um, there are many, many other drawings that did not make it into life. George Biddle did publish his wartime drawings elsewhere um, in dedicated publications, but um, this, um, the man, um, they robbed the shoes from the dead. You see him lying there and he's, um, he's in his, his um, stocking feet um, without his shoes. Um, this is an example of some of the work and the extraordinary delicacy um, and poignancy um, of, these, of these wartime drawings from Tunisia and from Italy. Um, here's another drawing. This is also on view right now at Woodmere on um, Private Lionel George Lyons, three, 385 Engineers Battalion. Um, this was one of the fellows in the division that George Biddle came to know as he accompanied um, the, the division in their march up through Italy. And um, this was reproduced um, in, in, in life, accompanied by the words by George Biddle. Um, in many, and, and um, this fellow is African American. It was um, reproduced together with a drawing of a, an Asian American soldier. And um, George Biddle writes, in many ways, it is a democratic army, the most democratic, certainly in the history of our country. In every division, you will find boys from California, Texas, from New England, Pennsylvania, Oregon, or Florida. There are boys from the cities, the hill country, and the sea. And I think, you know, the part of that statement that the text doesn't um, express, but there are people of different races that make up the United States Army. Um, a painting that emerged from this process um, is German war prisoners. Um, these were two German Nazi officers that were captured by the regiment in Tunisia. You can see they're held behind barbed wire and somebody had to be assigned to keep guard over them. They traveled with the division up through Italy as prisoners. Um, George Biddle showed, they are older men. They're staring at each other in the eyes. Um, one mouth is open. One of them has a monocle in his eye. Um, and, you know, not this painting, but the one of two drawings associated with it was again reproduced and published by George Biddle. And it was um, with a text that said, it was not you that whipped us, but your artillery. We were without air coverage, man to man, we are each worth six of you, Max, and then he doesn't write Schelling, but Max Schelling was the German Nazi boxer that had a famous um, matchup with the American Joe Lewis in the late 1930s. Um, Max Schelling won the first match, 
Joe Lewis famously won the second match. It was seen as, you know, a battle of nations. Um, so he's saying, Max knocked out Joe Lewis once, but beware the return match. We are prefer preparing for Den Tag. We are preparing for the day, the Krieg, the next war. So it's 1943. The war is raging. And, um, you know, this is George Biddle's um, um, message um, to the world, um, you know, through this image and together with this image of the two um, imprisoned Nazis that he, um, um, I guess, came to know, came to witness. Um, that brings us up to Look Magazine, the war is over, it's 1946, and I'm showing the cover of, of, of this Look Magazine. Ironically, um, the person who appears on the cover is Hank, or maybe it's not ironic, it, it could be absolutely intentional. Hank Greenberg, who was known as, I think he was known as, geez, I think he was known as the Hebrew Hammer. I just kind of want to get that right. But uh, the first great star was a Jewish baseball player of America. And in this, um, in this edition of Look Magazine, America's Family Magazine, is an article, Evil Over Germany by George Biddle. And um, you see here the first, I believe it is a one, two, three, four, five page article where George Biddle provided illustrations and text. The title is Evil Over Germany. You see the opening image, which um, is the prisoners um, who are on trial at Germany. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but here is the face of Goering. Next to him is Rudolf Hess, and um, on down the line, a you know rogues gallery of the war criminals who were tried at Nuremberg. George Biddle's brother, Francis Biddle, was one of the four judges. He was representing the United States on the judges panel. He was one of the four judges at the Nuremberg trials. Um, Francis Biddle, you remember the last time I mentioned him, he was in law school. Well, he rose from being Solicitor General of the United States to being Attorney General of the United States under Franklin Roosevelt. Truman, um, when he became president, wanted his own Attorney General, and so um, gave Francis Biddle various other jobs, including representing the United States um, in Nuremberg. So. Um, George is there, I think, in part, you know, as moral support to his brother, with whom he was very, very close, but also because this is an artist who wants to be where things are happening and things need to be conveyed. Um, these drawings from Nuremberg, we, we don't have at Woodmere this particular drawing, um, the opening drawing, but we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna start showing some of the works that we do have at Woodmere. It, it opens here. And Look Magazine, in a little bit of a preamble, um, writes, and actually I think I have it um, in larger text here. Yeah, they say, George Biddle commissioned by Look to do a word portrait study. So, you know, this five page article is a word portrait study where it's the words and the images that go together. Um, and, and George Biddle, in his own words, um, describes, um, you know, from his, his first-hand study as described above, um, he describes that in five short years, this empire, um, the Nazi empire, has been responsible for the bloodletting of some 20 million soldiers and civilians, the murder of another 6 million Jews, the destruction of Europe, um, now under the merciless glare of the, you know, 40 kilo whatever lights, what impressions does one get of these once powerful men? How arrogant is their profile in defeat? This is the question um, that he opens this with. Um, what follows are two large pages where we get these kind of 
word portrait studies. And so here are portraits of the individual defendants together with George Biddle's own descriptions of them, who they were and you know, what he thought of them. Um, the next page is a full page um, dedicated to Hermann Goring, um, uh, the medal-loving ex-Reichsmarshal um, who was supposed to be Hitler's, um, who, was, uh, who was to follow Hitler as the, the next leader of, of the Third Reich. Um, Hess uh, Goering gets his own page. Um, and, and then what follows is another page with um, a drawing of the judges and um, Francis Biddle is in the center there. He's the fellow, um, again, if you can see my cursor, um, he's the bald headed fellow who's turned to the side to speak to the fellow who he's sitting next to. And you can see solemn judges from Russia, Britain, United States and France sit in tribunal. Um, U.S. Judge Francis Biddle, above center, confers with alternate judge John Parker. So, you know, George Biddle is telling us what's happening there. And um, in slightly larger text, I wanted, um, I, I wanted to just show or, or even just read a little bit of George Biddle's words. Um, he describes, he opens this, this has been my visual impression of the Nazis on trial. Now, to understand what is being judged at Nuremberg, one must know that these defendants are a microcosm of the German nation, projecting their guilt upon a common sacrificial goat, Hitler. Nowhere is there a consciousness of guilt. Such absences of all feelings of responsibility only magnifies the crimes to a terrifying scale. And I have to say, I find this absolutely amazing that from the opening, George Biddle is saying, you know, this is, you know, Hitler may be, you know, the evil leader, um, but everybody's hanging their own guilt on him. Nowhere is there a sense of responsibility. Um, and, and he goes on um, to describe um, that, um, uh, um, th these or they are more or less normal, yet share in common a ruthless ambition which caused them to lose all moral perspective. Most subscribe to Christian virtues, but manage to rationalize their deeds by their perverted ideology. An abnormal society can, alas, be made of normal men. They were the easy tools for carrying out the purposes of the sinister Hitler. But how do the rest of Germans feel? The obedient and trustable citizens who participate only indirectly in the Nuremberg trials. Um, and what, what he finds appalling, he said, you know, these appalling disclosures of, of what's going on give them, the Germans, no sense of guilt. On the contrary, the information merely proves, and this is in their point of view, they're innocent. Um, and so, you know, he's saying, well, okay, so this is, this is something bigger than just Hitler or really just these men on trial. Um, now then, should we judge the Nuremberg trials? Not, I think, with too great pessimism or too great hope. Even if disillusion and broken promises bring another war, Nuremberg will have put on the record with absolute fairness and objectivity, one of the blackest chapters in the history of civilized man. If, on the other hand, a better and federated Europe should struggle upward out of today's chaos, if the nations can achieve harmony and peace, Nuremberg will go down in history as the Magna Carta of the New World. Um, the next issue of Look Magazine to include an article illustrated and written by George Biddle from Germany um, came out in June 1925. You get a, port, a sense that 
often they put sports figures on the cover of the magazine, sports figures, um, as well as movie stars, as far as I can see. Um, and, you know, this is a very different article. It's June. Um, it's a few months later. The trials haven't concluded, but it's a very different kind of an article. It's not full pages. I mean, it does spread across four pages, but they're sort of half page um, pieces of writing accompanied by drawings. And, you know, this is not so much about the trials, but it's about what George Biddle is witnessing in the people that he's encountering who are, um, um, you know, whose, whose lives have been destroyed um, by Germany and by the war. And he writes, you know, just a, a, above the beginning of the article, um, the title is, and I just have to move around my screen a little bit, Hitler's ghost still haunts Germany. The Nazis left behind them a legacy of hatred and persecution that lives on today to menace the whole world. And so he's saying that, you know, this racism, this anti-Semitism has not gone away. War is over in Europe, but the killing goes on today. Race discrimination and persecution are as terrible as under Hitler all over Europe. I've seen the displaced persons. And he goes on to describe them and he goes on um, to depict specific individuals um, that he's met. The article continues with these uh, portraits and descriptions. And again, the theme is that, um, you know, the, the, the persecution and the horrors of what has happened has not stopped. Um, he writes, um, and, and we actually have the drawings, I think, for these two young men in the upper left. Sam Ozachowski is a 13-year-old Lithuanian from Lodz. He escaped from the ghetto when the SS troops came through with police dogs to round up children for gas chambers. For two years, he lay out in the woods and fought the Polish Army of Liberation. He still flees anti-Semitism. And then down below, this is Sperling Meyer. A tattooed numeral on his right arm shows that he was at Auschwitz. Whose, in, whose inmates were to be exterminated. Somehow he was saved and moved to a work camp. He is 12 with the body of a younger child, but eyes of an adult who, who suffered and still does. And so the theme you know, of, these, of these drawings and of these writings is the continuity of the impact of, um, of the persecution and anti-Semitism. These two are not mother and daughter, there were few family groups in concentration camps. This woman and child adopted each other for companionship, homeless, without a country, still persecuted. They are now fleeing to Palestine. Um, the purpose of this article, the Nazi virus still lives. Can democracy keep it from spreading? Um, he describes um, he describes a, um, um, you know, a marching, a, a, a parade um, of, of young Zionists. They're singing Hebrew and Yiddish hymn, hymns. Um, he describes that they're wearing discarded um, German military clothing. Um, he, he says they're a little comical. They're out of step. They're out of tune. But he says, as they turn the corner out from the dark passageways comes, came heavy Bavarian peasant boys and red-faced beefy girls, their hands like hams on their hips. They looked after the little band and their faces darkened with thick, ugly smiles. What was written in those cold, clear eyes was cynicism and hate. This is Hitler's legacy to Germany, to Europe. Yes, the killing goes on. And... Um, um, this is article number two, um, published in, in Look Magazine by George Biddle. Um, the last of the, of the, um, articles from his German drawings that get published in Look. Um, the last thing that I want to say before turning this over to Rabbi Turnborg is to say that, you know, these themes and these ideas are going to be constant from this point forward in the overall working of George Biddle's career. Here's a, a print, um, a hand-colored lithograph, a colored lithograph, not hand-colored, 
um, called the Master Race, 1952. George Biddle made this in Rome. Um, he was a fellow at, uh, at the American Academy in Rome at this time. Um, he's probably looking at medieval views of hell, and he's invented this monster-like half-human, half-animal creature who's the master race, subjugating a man and woman in the lower right and left. And you know, above them, um, we see a man with a whip who I, I, I take to be kind of a representation of this master race monster and um, you know, the people, they seem like um, victims um, who are struggling, who are, are expressing various states of, of, of being lost and, and non-grounded on the earth, which is to say that, you know, for George Biddle, this is an ongoing um, uh, exploration, you know, that has more to offer. Um, with that, um, I am glad to stop talking and 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 invite Rabbi Tornberg to take it over and speak more specifically about um, you know what she sees as the importance of these works. Thank you, Bill. Um, I'm going to share what I see as the importance of these works, just as Bill had indicated, but. Uh, an important part of this conversation is what you who are attending are thinking as well, because all of this is really just a conversation. There's no one way of looking at it. But I do think that a lens that Bill shared with us that's really important is that all of these works are coming through George Biddle's lens of social consciousness. And he believed that art was, uh, in the serve needed to be in the service of humanity and of in the service of making the world better. So he actually was uh, an artist who who rejected a lot of the more abstract modernism that some of his uh, contemporaries were all excited about and promoting because they didn't seem to touch people where they actually were living their lives. So. When I think about the Look Magazine drawings, a couple things come to mind. And the first is that he's operating, it, it, it's not precisely journalism, but it's, it's close to journalism. I would say it's more like an op-ed. He's uh, definitely got a, a point of view and he's not just reporting the facts, but he is doing it in a journalistic mode, kind of. Uh, but you know, when we think of journalism, especially when we think of the imagery of journalism, uh, I mean, it's it's a false it's a false thing to say that that photography doesn't have a point of view or photography um, is just the facts, ma'am. But um, but photography does give us a little bit more of like the the reality image or what we call verisimilitude. So I thought it would be interesting to look at this uh, cover on the right. This is a book uh, that um, Bill shared with me by Francis Biddle. George Biddle's uh, brother, who was one of the judges at Nuremberg, and it was a, it was it's a it's a book of his experience there. But you can see the photograph on the cover, and these are some of uh, the people on trial. And then, of course, if you take a like a zoom, if you zoom in to the top left, you'll see that that's what he's rendered in the image on the left. So. Goering is the the here. Let me see if I can. You see my cursor? That yeah, visible to others. Ah, no, maybe Bill can help me. So in the photo, uh, now I was looking for, there. So there's Goering, Goering, and um, then if you look at the the image on the other side, there he is there, and it it's very interesting because when I first saw these images, not just this one, but the other ones. I had I had some strange feelings about it because obviously I'm not a fan of Nazis, but he seems to be drawing in a way that that kind of skews us to have a point of view that he wants us to have. And we know that he really wants that point of view because of some of the text that he writes. And he's got a lot of important things to say about guilt about 
um, you know, responsibility, about ethics, but he also dips a little bit into caricature. And, and that, that was, that's a strange place for me as a, a viewer of art and as a Jew, because of course we've seen those same tools used against people who were seen as different. So it made me ask lots of questions about what it can look like to try and put forth a point of view on an issue uh, to try and raise the community's social conscience, but to do it in a way that uh, is in the service of good and not in the service of evil. So uh, the, the comparison that we're looking at here is that we see that there's a lot of similarity. In fact, he's really taking it um, perhaps right even from this photograph, not, not precisely this photograph because you can see he's wearing headphones in the drawing, but in the and in the photo, he is not. Um, so perhaps it was a different moment in the trial, but this seems to be where they were sitting. He seems to be wearing the same coat. Um, he, he, the, some of his features seem a little more pronounced to me, anyway, in the in the the drawing. And the same is true for Hess, who's sitting next to him. Uh, he's got you know these giant hands that uh, Garin does, and uh, we we see you know, him kind of leaning forward. Uh, so it, it it gives a certain impression. However, it's exacerbated by some of the text that accompanies this particular image. I think we're ready for the next. Ah, okay. So here's another one of those uh, moments where he's acting as a, he's acting as a journalist, bringing imagery and ideas to the Look Magazine audience. Uh, but this is a series of very, I, I find these very powerful. The next couple of images that we're going to look at are uh, defendants who all have numbers. And of course, that, you know, is so resonant of the numbers that Jews were given in the camps. Uh, but one thing that's interesting is even though there is, you know, he does have the tools of caricature and he is able to play with, you know, uh, uh, details of people's faces in a way that can lean us towards one side or another. Um, they all are very, it is very sophisticated, right? Each of these are, they're not fully ridiculous. Uh, they're, you know, perhaps um, feeling vacant or um, belligerent or um, confused, but they're all different, right? It's a very, very much a reflection of what he's seen in the individuals. I think we're ready for the next one. So there's more of the same kind of thing. And, and, and you can see that he has different moments for each of the figures. Uh, the next one is um, some of the same folks, you know, in a, in a, different, in a different mode. Uh, and it, it reminds me, um, a friend of mine who's an artist pointed out that this this is also in the uh, in the tradition of of uh, of courtroom art reporters, right? That, that there are illustrators who come into courtrooms to say, "Here's kind of what's happening." So he's 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 utilizing that tradition and how uh, images are rendered in that environment. And then the next one, I think it's that last. Yes, this is the really powerful one. Um, it's entitled as you can see, 36 to be hanged. For those of you who have a, a knowledge of Jewish tradition and Jewish uh, ideas, Judaica, know that 36 is a multiple of 18, which stands for chai, which means life. So 36 is an important number for Jews, probably just a coincidence in this case, um, but I thought it was a powerful thing to realize. Uh, it's also interesting to note that this gentleman on the far right, uh, he's number 40, which means that some of them were not hanged. So this was the verdict that came out. And uh, this, is, this is that moment that George Biddle is seeing. And you can see all the different, different kinds of um, emotions and ideas that are going across their faces. Uh, and it's, I mean, I hope you agree that it's very powerful uh, and I, I think we're ready for the next one. Um, now, 
I don't think we have the text right here, but in the Look Magazine text, there's a, a, an opening where he talks about um, what is the face of evil? Like, what does it look like? You know, how can we be in this room? I mean, Bill talked about the, 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 the normal men that they were, right? So what is it, lo what is it like to, to look them in the face? How, how can they just look like regular people? And then like, is there more below that? And that's where he starts to like play between verisimilitude and caricature. Um, here we have Franz von Patten and on the left, is his, the, the drawing that George Biddle did. And on the right is the drawing as it appeared in Look Magazine with the, the text below. And I'll read it for you because it's, it's kind of small, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's important to hear what kinds of details he decides to offer to describe who he's seen. Ace spy and diplomat in two world wars, von Papen had been Germany's ambassador to Turkey. He was captured, however, in a hunting lodge near Stockhausen inside r the rural pocket in April 1945 by troops of U.S. 9th Army. Von Papen II, okay, so he's referred, said this about somebody else earlier, has the face of an animal rather than a human being, right? So this, this is where my alarm bells go off a little bit because it's like, what does it mean to dehumanize someone in this way? It certainly is something that Jews have been victims of. And it's certainly something that African Americans have been victims of, immigrants have been victims of, lots of people have been victims of rendering a person as not human. So it's a challenge for us to think about what does it mean that Biddle is using this technique, you know, in the service of helping us to see people who really did horrible, evil things, but it's the same technique. Just something to think about. So uh, let's see, he has the face of an animal rather than a human being. It is the long snout of a coyote or a fox, of a weasel, jackal, rat. It is infinitely sly, belonging to something that weaves in and out on padded feet. It never faces, but always approaches obliquely or from behind. It is infinitely hungry and cruel, like an animal that comes in only for the kill. Very powerful. Um, we're hard pressed to to try to find a way to feel sympathy for this man, but but it, it is a dehumanizing text. Let's can we go to the next one? So this is similar, um, not not quite the same dehumanization, but uh, definitely a skewed uh, and very um, pointed view. Um, Joachim von Ribbentrop, former foreign minister von Ribbentrop, disguised himself and fled from Berlin to avoid capture. After an interview, or, uh, sorry, after an intensive manhunt, the son of a Hamburg wine merchant tipped off British troops who captured the Nazi leader in a Hamburg lodging house where he was sharing an apartment with a 35 year old divorcee. It was his sister who identified him. He is infinitely aged and weary. He looks up about him and at you to let you know, as it were, that he knows he is at the rope's end. His pasty gray face has fallen to pieces. No spark from within can bring any breath of life to that abject hopelessness. So this is interesting because he, he, he doesn't want us to have sympathy for this guy. Uh, but, and and it's, it's part of that page that Bill showed us where there is a face and a paragraph underneath and a face and a paragraph underneath. So they're all together but he doesn't utilize quite the same dehumanization. There's something about this man's face that, that help, Biddle is able to see the, the complete loss of faith and hope that's in him. Um, not in a way that, you know, makes us want to be super sympathetic, but it, it's different, I think, than the previous, um, the Von Papen image. So I think we're ready for the next one. Um, so Gustav Jodl, a former chief of, general, of the general staff, Jodl signed Germany's surrender at Rheims and made a plea for mercy. On May 23rd, 1945, he was taken with Admiral Dunitz at Flensburg. He looked scraggy, red-nosed, and half-plucked. 
Again, we're an animal, like a turkey gobbler who has shed his feathers, anything but an officer. So there's the satire that that uh, Biddle sometimes utilizes. Alfred Rosenberg, uh, commissioner for occupied Russian territory and Nazi philosopher, in quotes. Rosenberg was caught by the British in a hospital near Flensburg on, in May 1945. With a reputation for doing everything in bad taste, he was the brain truster and philosopher ideologist who wanted to be called director of philosophic outlook. As much as any man, he molded the, sh molded the shape and directed the impulse of Nazism. A timid, shy, and sensitive looking man, he resembles a small town college professor of a dead language in some remote place. And that makes me think like, what's wrong with that college professor? <laughs> he has a rodent's nose, a sucked in mouth, and a bewildered sweaty forehead. Okay, not appealing, right? And, and, and again, compared to an animal. Um, although as Bill mentioned, uh, the small town professor might be a really nice guy that you wanna have over for dinner, but George Biddle is coming from this aristocratic family that thinks that that's a, a boring and unappealing person to be around, I guess. Now, I want everyone to take a look at this. Um, this is another drawing that George Biddle did uh, at the Nuremberg trials. A young person, a very young person, obviously. And uh, he's got his hand over his heart. He has kind of a pensive look, perhaps worried. I want you to think, and if we were like, you know, live and interactive with each other, I'd take, I'd take answers, but think about just looking at this what what you feel like is going on in this face what 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 biddle is trying to convey in looking i think there could be a lot of answers to this but then biddle gives us text to the back of this drawing bill wrote son of a camp commander of concentration camp Mauthausen, siegfried zyrus uh, accused of shooting 50 inmates with a rifle which he got on his birthday, killed 30 in one day, his birthday, denies it. So he's, he's vacillating a little between character and a little between just sort of as straight an image as he can. And sometimes it's, it's hard to tell what it is that we're seeing. He wants us to see a certain thing, so he gives us the text. I think we can go on to the next one, Bill. This is an interesting one. This is a, a Jewish man, we think. He's Jewish, wearing a kippah. Uh, and he apparently was at the Nuremberg trials. We're not exactly sure about, of his identity, but you can see a much more um, thoughtful, uh, sympathetic face. At least that's how I interpret it in my history. Okay, so as I mentioned, as B and as Bill mentioned, uh, the uh, Biddle's, Biddle's thinking about social justice, about um, making the world um, a better place for everybody. And uh, one of the things that he looks at, especially with his wife, Hélène Sardot, um, coming from a Jewish family that certainly would have been killed in Europe, uh, or at least, uh, you know, parts of it would have would not have survived. Uh, that that you have the Jews who are still, as Bill showed us in that that June Look magazine, the the later one. There's these Jewish people who are still suffering and are chased by this unrelenting anti-Semitism and this unrelenting sense of like refugee status that they can't get away from and that they're chased around the world, that we turn now to this Atlantic uh, monthly, is it, I guess it's Atlantic <laughs> at the time, this Atlantic article for which he does a series of drawings uh, called Israel, Young Blood and Old. And it's a problematic article for a number of reasons, but he has a great amount of hope in the article. The, the, he goes to Palestine, which is becoming Israel, and he's very, overwhelmed 
by the excitement and the energy in the air and the youth and the, the, the vibrancy of this new nation. And it's almost like uh, there, the idea that, that perhaps the world is moving more towards uh, a world of democracy, a world of justice, and away from a world of repression and a world of fascism. And so that's a, this is a really hopeful piece in a lot of ways. And you can tell he's got these images of like attractive, young, vibrant, energetic people, which is not the image of Jews that had been seen in the June article um, from Look Magazine. And, and uh, anybody who's studied that transition um, after World War II knows that that whole concept of the, the Sabra, the, the Zionist uh, pioneer going and building the land, uh, that, that, that strong uh, idea of, a, of, a, of an Israeli uh, is, is a completely different image from what was being a bit, what was being left in Europe. And, and, and so he's part of that transition to a new way of seeing the image of a Jew. Um, with, with that, I'm going to say thank you, Rabbi Tornberg. Um, it's sort of amazing to look at these images together with you and together with your thoughts. Um, I'm going to go out of full screen mode so that I can see you. And um, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question, which sure. I, I'm interested in, um, you know, our other our participants thoughts on this question as well. Um, you know, and it has to do with the depiction of evil, you know, and, and I think that you you described a lot of different kinds of representation in George Biddle. Um, the, here's the son of the Nazi concentration camp. Um, delicate, elegant drawing. Um, the 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 words throw it to a place that's very deep. Um, and and I agree that there's a there's a stylization um, that he employs here um, in these in these images of the Nazi defendants um, that that um, yeah, he's making them animal like and mm -hmm. they're, they're they're vermin to him. Um, what is the face of evil? Is it both? Is it I mean, well, it's interesting because uh, I love when Bill and I were preparing this, he was like, well, first I'm going to ask you what's evil. <laughs> like, yeah. oh, this is a very big question. What's the face of evil? So one of the things that I, I was uncomfortable with when I first looked at you, Bill, you know this because I, I just yeah. know this, um, is, is and, and I intimated it earlier in my remarks tonight, that if we are, if we know that the tools of stylized and caricatured imagery serves to dehumanize people. Seeing that used against someone who is just happens to be your enemy doesn't feel safe, right? It feels like we should all just be able to show our actual faces. It also makes me really uncomfortable to a certain extent, I mean, I, I have some context, if there's time, distance and all that. But if, say say I'm looking at Biddle's work and what I'm learning from this is when I see that rat-faced guy, you know, I know he's evil. We all have seen a rat-faced guy who's been wonderful, right? Somebody's face doesn't actually necessarily show the quality of their character. And the, idea that you'd know the bad guy by looking at them. I mean, it's very Scooby-Doo, right? Like this, it's, um, it's, it's very much um, how, how kids read literature and, and, and look at cartoons and things. But even, even kids getting into middle grades start to realize like, oh no, you can't judge a book by its cover. That doesn't actually tell me anything. So I think that something like this, if we were to do too much of it, could exacerbate the 
it could prevent us from being able to identify evil when we can see it. Because what we're looking at is someone's face instead of what they're saying or what they're doing. We need to, we're all victim of this, right? This is very easy to do. This. Um, there's a reason that political cartoons are so Im important and, and effective, but we, we need to keep paying attention to what people are doing. Is, is this more the face of evil? I mean, is, is, I mean. I think they all are. I mean, this, this, when we didn't have the text and this was just an image that I agree is, is delicate and thoughtful and, and could be on any number of subjects. Um, that, that could be evil because evil, evil isn't just about the face. Now, I really think that that quote that you shared with us, Bill, from the letter uh, that George wrote, George Biddle wrote to the artists in uh, the, it, as they were preparing to join the troops in World War II, I, I think this is a really important piece for him because as an artist, He's basically saying, use all of your art, use all of your tools. Um, you didn't read this, um, but it's, it, it's, 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 I liked it. it it's just below um, the, the place where it says omit nothing. It says, you may be guided by Blake's mysticism, by Goya's cynicism and savagery, by Delacroix's romanticism, by Daumier's humanity and tenderness, or better still, follow your own inevitable star. So he's basically saying, you're an artist right? You're an artist. He's not a journalist in many ways. He is saying, I, that is not your job here. You're supposed to give the emotional reality of what this is. So it gets into this sort of gray area, like who gets to say who's evil, who gets to say what's right and what's wrong. But, but Biddle is very clear. He's looking at evil in the face. He's, he's looking at, first of all, we know what happened at Nuremberg and we know what they were talking about. But he also is very um, earnest about his sense that, that there is good in this world and plenty and wellness and democracy. And then there's the other side of the coin and that we have to do everything we possibly can to support the, the, fir the first set of those values. Um, that you know, he knows that, that the United States uh, is, is not perfect, uh, that, that it has uh, its drawbacks, but that the best of all possible uh, versions of society are those that promote and defend democracy. And that's really his point of view. So it's, he has a lot of clarity. I think that clarity is more of a challenge in the 21st century. I, I'm wondering, I mean, li listening to your words, um, I'm, I'm wondering about the significance of context here with the art, because, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm flipping around. Um, let's, let's see. Um, you know, here we have, um, you know, this, this was a double page spread. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, some, some of these are more stylized, caricaturized than others. Um, you know, Look Magazine is a popular magazine. Um, you know, the next page, there's a big article about June Allison and what kind of bathing suit she's wearing. And, and literally that's mm -hmm. the next article that comes or, or the article that comes before, um, you know, it, it's um, it's wanting to put a, a point across. I mean, it, it's 1946. People don't know who these. I mean, you know, maybe maybe Hess and maybe Goering are world famous, but I'm guessing most of these men are not. And he's drawing it. He wants to draw attention to them, and he's the context here is he's using he's using the language of um of you know he's using the language of popular culture 
mm -hmm. uh, to put a point across. Um, that's a very different context, I think. Um, and I think that this is where, um, you know, this is a work of art that I don't believe was has ever been shown in the public. I mean, we are the first people to see it, um, you know, outside of George Biddle's studio. Um, we have we're not showing this right now at Woodmere, although, of course, it will be in the upcoming exhibition that we eventually organize. Um, this was not submitted to, to Look Magazine. It was not published. I mean, we don't know what context George Biddle would have used this in, but, um, you know, we have the advantage of the notes that he took on the back. Um, and, um, you know, so again, it's like we're almost, we're create, we, when we show this, we're going to have to create a context mm -hmm. so that this image can, um, you know, this image and its words can, um, you know, move out into the world and have a meaning as we share it with people. Um, I, I, I feel like, you know, a lot of the work that we do in a museum is to, is to create that sense of context and then also bring out, and, and as we tell these stories, as we're telling these stories tonight, is also um, give a sense of the context that that makes the art um and it's and it's different languages make sense mm -hmm. um does that does that make sense to you yeah um i mean one thing that is so neat about this or interesting to me i guess is is that the context here was this mass publication yeah it's not a these are not museum pieces and actually even though George Biddle is, I mean, anybody who's looked at, at his, uh, an array of his work, which, you know, you can see at the Woodmere right now, uh, I mean, he's extraordinarily gifted. Uh, he's got an amazing range of styles and, and he can turn off, turn on and off certain ways of, of uh, creating imagery and, and uh, he's, he's so versatile um, and he's choosing, I mean, it's a gig, I'm sure, <laughs> but he's also choosing. I'm gonna perfect. I'm gonna put this out there in a way that, you know, Sally and Joe sitting around the kitchen table looking at the magazine are gonna be touched by this and say, "Oh my God, this is the face of you." Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is something else I wanted to mention about the publication of this article. When Bill, when when you reached out and and asked me if I was uh, if I could join you, and you said Nuremberg trials. I was like, okay, yeah, Nuremberg trials. Like I know what they are, and I know kind of when they were. And but in in researching, uh, you know, just to get a little more background, I, I I think that I had always, at some level, I knew, but also kind of took for granted that the idea that personal responsibility uh is was not something you could abdicate in a situation of a war court uh was a new idea at nuremberg because everybody was i mean the defense was pointing their fingers at like why they were just following orders right and we've heard that that's like a canard we've heard it before you're know, like oh, i was just following orders. and of course like that's not acceptable that's a crime against humanity that was defined at Nuremberg. So he's he's trying to get his head around just like what is this thing? Were these people who did all this stuff, but they're normal people who are following orders, but then all this stuff happened. Like, how do we have responsibility? How do we call people to account? You know, like what happens if you're in leadership? What happens if you're following leadership? What does that look like? And and he never really lands in a satisfying place because of course he's very good at identifying for us that this isn't over. And he does that in June when he, you know, shows what's still going on in Europe. That that 
the anti-Semitism, the hatred, the corruption and the evil that led to the Holocaust. Like Hitler's gone, but those things and all the things that led to those things are still there. We still have all the, the pieces that we needed. We just needed this charismatic leader to kind of pull it all together and say, let's point it in this direction. And that's pretty terrifying. That's part of what Biddle's struggling with is that he, he sees that, that the Germans are all saying, oh, it was Hitler, but that that's not actually an honest that's look at what's going on. Yeah. I think we have some questions though. I, I mean, I see. Yeah, let's. But I don't um, know what they are, Hildy. Hildy, would you share? Yeah, we do. So well, there are a few, few comments and a few questions. So um, I'm going to start with the first person because they put it. They wrote this earliest. In all the drawings, I don't see any defendant looking either repentant or sorry, or crestfallen. How would Biddle portray today's doers of evil? And then she goes on to say, in one of the drawings, there were three men. And they were shown with their arms in in almost the same position. It reminds me of marching in step. The only they're only doing what I'm only doing what my superiors told me to do. Hmm. That's very powerful, Jocelyn. Uh, yeah, that's a that's a wonderful observation. I, I assume that this is the drawing that we're referring to, where the arms of one figure. Um, follow the, the the same pattern the same shape and line of the of the figure next to it I, I assume that this is what it is um I what what I find in these drawings and I and I think that Rabbi Tornberg described this is you know a great diversity of emotional states um the, the this figure on the right um is is um, is, is turned inward. Um, he's got a very different emotional state than, say, the figure next to him who's staring out and, you know, maybe even defiant in his stance. Um, he, you know, I, I, crestfallen. Um, I, I, I feel that, um, again, I, I see a range of emotions, um, I uh, and, and I think you can see it again in, in this group that Rabbi Tornberg selected. Um, uh, um, you know, here again, you know, this figure seems to be thinking. This figure has a very different body language. Number thirteen, you know, he's pulled back. Um, I, you know, I, I, I don't think, I mean, in my sense from the text is that there is not a lot of remorse in these men. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of different emotional state that's expressed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here's a different question. Um, sure. I am confused by the drawing of the black soldier and the accompanying text. The word democracy, the repetition of boys, that soldier was serving in a segregated army. Was he, meaning Biddle, being sarcastic? Well, let's go back to the drawing. Um, I think that he's using language and using the word democratic to mean, I think what he means here is inclusive in the sense of you know, democracy, you know, one person, one vote. I, I think that the text is trying to say, um, you know, we've got people from California, Texas, New England, Pennsylvania, Oregon, and Florida. There are boys from the city's hill country in the sea. Um, I think he's using the language of his time um, in a way that, you know, we would choose different language today. Um, but I think that that's what he means by democratic. Um, you know, I also it, think when he says boys, he, you know, oh, you know, send a salami to your boy in the army, you know, like it's uh, the, the soldiers were called boys. They were they were your young. They were your sons, you know, and they went off to war. 
I don't think it's a like you're a boy because you're black. I think he was referring to soldiers. My impression. Yeah, I I I, I agree with that. Um, in terms of in terms of um, the division being segregated, um, you know, I, I think we need to look into this. I mean, I it is very beautiful drawing. It's a figure. You know, it's a person that George Biddle knew. I mean, this is an individual. Um, and, um, you know, I think we, I mean, this is the beginning. I mean, we want to do a lot more research about all of these, um, all of these figures and all of these um, individuals and the stories that they tell. And, you know, I think that's a good point. And, you know, I, I think we want to look into the 385th engineers battalion i mean what was the role of the engineers battalion i don't know the answer to that and i don't know you know about the nature of the battalion in terms of you know was it a um was it a segregated uh battalion i i just don't know the answer to that and i think this is a question for rabbi tornberg how would you imagine the drawings would look different if george biddle was attending the January 6th committee hearings. Okay, so uh, Hildy, I'm super confused. It looks like I asked that question and I did not. You no, know, I, I guess that. I, I, I think it's, it's intended for you. That's what I, I okay. think it was meant. Um, okay, so how would you imagine the drawings look different if George Biddle was attending the January 6th committee hearings? Um, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I, I, uh, you know, like he was living in his time. I, I feel like if we sort of like plucked him out of his time and put him in front of the, I think there'd be a lot of similarities. I think he'd do a lot of the same stuff, uh, but that would also, um, you know, he's also very influenced by the idea that, that the Germans and the Nazis are over there doing everything they can to, to, to be the anti-democracy forces that they are. Uh, he, it would be interesting to see what Biddle would do if he had to look at internal divides in the United States uh, which he was aware of, you know, he wasn't like he, he thought we were perfect and, and everybody was all one big happy family, but we're in a really much more divided place, at least um, much more, uh, we, we were, it seems like we were less divided on the surface, um, depending on what color you were, uh, in, in World War II, there's really a sense of like, this is what it is to be American. And, and so, so what would he do given his background and his interest in social justice. I, I don't. I, I. I don't know. I don't know where he'd land in the twenty first century. Uh, but if whoever he was um, drawing would potentially be subject to these, you know, to the same tools that he has at his disposal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would add that I think that in, in George Biddle's lifetime, you know, democracy was the only only alternative to authoritarianism and fascism and, you know, not just Spain, Italy, Germany. Um, he's very much aware of Stalinist Russia and the persecutions and violence of the Stalinist regime. And um, so democracy is the only thing that he can hold up as imperfect as he knows that it is, as, as Rabbi Turnberg said, as imperfect as he knows American democracy is, um, it's, it, it, it's all he's got. And, and I think that the January 6th um, question is a really good question. Um, I think he would be horrified by the assault on the Capitol and, um, you know, I, 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 I honestly think that he would have wanted to make images and the images would have expressed, you know, a range of emotions. I mean, I, I think he's a humanist in that sense. And I think that these, um, you know, the caricature like stylizations are, are pointed. And um, I, I can imagine, 
I, I, I can imagine them. I mean, political satire is you know, part of mainstream cultural imagery. I mean, Donald Trump is, you know, caricatured and lampooned probably more than any other person on the planet. Um, and I would imagine George Biddle would have lots of fun being part of that. I mean, I, I, I mean, we don't know what he would really do, but um, uh, I, 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 I think he would engage with it. Um, another comment, how Biddle would depict January 6th witnesses would likely depend on the intended audience. Mm. Okay. I agree with that. Sure. Yeah, they would, be would actually, you know, that is really actually a, a very important statement because I don't think for a second that George Biddle doesn't think about who's going to see his work and how he can communicate with that viewer in, in any of his stuff. It's just the impression that I get from looking at his things. He, he knew exactly who was going to be reading Look Magazine, exactly what he wanted to say to them, and exactly how they would hear it most of the time. Well, that's what we have in comments and questions. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, with that, I want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you, Hildy, and especially thank you, Rabbi Tornberg. Um, I, I, I would reiterate, I feel like this is the beginning of coming to terms with these works of art. Um, they are sort of deeply um, gripping to me um, and, and, you know, our purpose at Woodmere is to you know, we, we want to share the stories that these works of art have to tell and stories that I think are, you know, multi-resonant and are going, I, I believe these mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And in a world where, um, you know, I mean, it, it, maybe it's, you know, the elephant in the room is that, you know, there is anti-Semitism in, Pennsylvania, there's anti-Semitism across the United States and across the world. And um, with anti-Semitism on the rise, I think, you know, we need to learn this history and engage with the emotions that it engenders um, so that we can move forward in a way that um, that moves the world to a better place. And to me, you know, art is part you know, artists, you know, we believe at Woodmere, and I know Rabbi Tornberg believes as well that, that, that art has a very important function in the development of just human consciousness and self-expression. And, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, these are works of art that um, we need to grapple with because they matter in terms of the world that we're living in today. So as a closing statement, um, Rabbi Tornberg, would you like to offer anything just as a closing remark or thank you? Um, I, I, anonymous attendee said she's also, she or he is also interested in, Hel in Helene Sardot's work, which actually, Bill, isn't it true that some of her stuff is part of the Biddle exhibit? Oh, yes, that's true. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you, you um, so a, a selection of Helen Sardo's work at Woodmere. And um, if you get your hands on a copy of the catalog, you can read it. You can certainly buy a copy um, in the museum gift store. You can buy it online or you can just go to the museum and there are gallery copies where you can sit and relax and just enjoy reading it. Um, there's a there's a short article about Helen Sardou that I wrote for the um, um, that I'm holding it up, that I wrote for the catalog. So you can learn more about her. And she's a wonderful and interesting artist that, you know, also we need to know more about. So um, stay tuned. <laughs> well, I want to thank um, 
again, thank you, uh, Bill and Hildy, for asking me to be part of this. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and exploring some really important artwork. I hope you found it meaningful. Thank you all. Be well. Good night. Good night.